Welcome to episode 37 of the Going For Broke Outdoors podcast, the podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. On today's podcast, I welcome Jacob Skleener to the show. Jacob is an up-and-coming hunter that I believe represents the best of the next generation of hunters. He's working smarter, and he's also working harder, and his results speak for themselves. In 2023, Jacob arrowed two out-of-state bucks, and he also arrowed his personal best deer in Wisconsin. In this episode, Jacob and I discuss preparing to tackle new terrain, the importance of being adaptable, the challenges of targeting a specific deer, and how to move on if those plans change. We talk about Jacob's 2023 Wisconsin buck and plans and goals moving forward. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. I want to mention that I have a new heavy metal themed design available in t-shirt or hoodies. I'll put a link in the description if you want to pick one up and help support this channel. Lastly, I want to thank everyone listening for the continued support. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube or your favorite audio platform. And finally, I want to give a shout out to Uncle Lou at Stealth Outdoors for helping to make this podcast possible. Check out Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com. While you're visiting Stealth Outdoors, don't forget to pick up some climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, or stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs this season. Stealth your mobile hunting setup by visiting www.stealthoutdoors.com to silence your gear and place an order today. And now, on to the podcast. All right, joined on the podcast today by Jacob Skleener. Jacob, how are you doing? Good, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the time to get on here. I know you've done a couple of podcasts recently. Man of the hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get your, your time periods that people like to talk to you, I guess, but You've, you've stuck with me throughout this entire season. We've talked for, what, it's been two or three seasons now? Oh, yeah. Myself, yep. too. So it's it's a pleasure to be on a Familiar Faces podcast. Yeah, glad to have you. So a couple things for people that don't know you. Just give me a brief introduction of who you are, how you got hunting, and just what's going on, uh, maybe a little bit outside hunting as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, my name's Jacob Sklenner. I was born and raised in southeastern Wisconsin, um, and um uh, I really got into hunting when I was younger, doing the whole Wisconsin gun season rich tradition, uh, went way up to northern Wisconsin, struggled a lot there with the family, just kind of doing the typical tactic everyone does is have their stand and sit it. Um, and we basically had seven days of the whole entire deer season that we hunted, and that was just all of gun. And um, I wanted to get into it more and eventually found bow hunting as I developed into my high school years and then. It was really like the last two years of high school. I, I did a couple bow hunts and um, started to like it, but didn't know what I was doing at all. So it wasn't super engaging to me. And then eventually found the Blood Brothers DVDs as I roamed into college and watched those and became completely obsessed. And, um, you know, I was younger. I, I wrestled my entire youth career and I was good enough to go into college and wrestle at a D3 school, UW Platteville in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. And I made a transition to hunting hills there, bluff country. So it was a very stark contrast in what I was used to hunting and um, dove into just that and podcasts and tactics and stuff like that and kind of combined the, the hard working mentality I had through wrestling and my degree, which was mechanical engineering, which involves a lot of data analysis and understanding trends and patterns and things like that to, to work for you. Um, I, I kind of used that as an analogy for hunting at times, and it helped me work really hard and work really smart at the same time. And, uh, you know, I won't claim that I'm better than anyone else in that regard. I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's something that I rely on to, to have success. And that's kind of how I've became a little more successful, I guess, than the average person you'd say on public land. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is the learning curve, right? You can shorten the learning curve. You definitely have to get out there and get the experience, but Putting that time into study, the maps, watching the DVDs, getting on the forums, you can definitely shorten the curve, and, and you're a good example mm -hmm. of that. Thank you. Yeah, so, I think, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Jeremy. No, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, so, and I, and I to your point, too, because I love talking about this part, is uh, there's so much information out there nowadays, and I got so lost when I first started at looking at just everything I could. And it wasn't until I started to narrow down my sources and, and listen to people that truly applied to what I was doing, which was high pressure public land hunting, chasing mature bucks, that I started to find things that related to me more. And through going through a lot of like really somewhat 
for information. You know, like if I was watching Monster Bucks or something like that, you know, it, it, it wasn't always directly applicable to what I was doing. And through finding what didn't work, I learned that it was very important to kind of vet your sources and to find out what applied to your specific situation. So I learned through a very trial and error process. And even if I was listening to someone as reputable as Andy May or Dan or someone like that, um, I tried everything that I heard in the field, and didn't just take it for fact right off the right off the bat. And that helped me find what really worked for my situations. And even more importantly, it helped me learn what I need to do to get on deer quickly and learn what I need to do to actually understand and take what I'm reading for face value. And so that's what's really helped me. And that that's kind of why I believe I had success in the marshes. I, I moved back from the marshes after I graduated. I, I moved from the hills back to the marshes uh, once I graduated and was on completely new properties this year and actually had a, a fairly good year this year too. And it's I, I credit a lot to to that kind of obviously all the people I got to listen to, but but also, you know, making sure that my tactics that I was employing truthfully worked for me in these situations. And that's a great point. And I've talked about this with other people, but in a way, every hunter develops their own style. And I think that's a somewhat self-reinforcing mechanism where you do things that work for you and whatever those things are, and then you're apt to do those more in the future. And it seems like guys uh, become a little more specialized in certain areas for better or for worse. And, and there's a lot of really well-rounded guys too. I'm not trying to say that you or, or other guys are one-dimensional, not at all, mm -hmm. but you do develop strengths and, and people that leverage those strengths seem to have outsized success. Yeah. 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 I agree. You can, you can sometimes tell the difference between some people that, are very good at their niche and they hammer that versus those that that move and adapt to and it, and either way is good you know they both get get deer in the ground but it, yeah. it is interesting to see that a lot of ways to skin the cat so well this is a good segue so you had a great year as you kind of alluded to i want to touch on uh, some of the stories throughout the year and your year from what i know started out in nebraska so to get into the nebraska hunt i'd like to know this was your first out-of-state hunt or your first western out-of-state hunt let's start there it was my first whitetail out of state hunt. Um, I had hunted, if you really count this, I hunted one time on a guided gun elk hunt when I was like 10 or 12 years old. And it was a disaster. We got like a foot and a half of snow in the first hour of the first day. Um, it, it didn't end up well. And in a camp that we typically, that the guides typically have a 60 to 70% success rate. And that's with just people that don't even ever hunt, like going into it. Um, we had one person out of like 26 shoot an elk. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it was it was a group, but I had a blast. I loved it. Um, but that's technically what you could call my first out-of-state hunt. And I'd done a lot of traveling. I'd done a lot of backcountry camping and fishing and stuff like that. So I had cut my teeth on large travel and, and being self-sustaining and, and being able to navigate areas, of course. So it helped to come in with that little experience. But this was my first whitetail out-of-state trip in Nebraska. Yeah, and I think that's a this will be a great example for a lot of people who have maybe went on one trip, haven't went on any trips, or are younger, or maybe if they're my age and looking to go on the first trip. So I'd like to know how did you prepare for that trip, and specifically when you're looking at the maps. Let's talk about mapping, but you could talk about overall preparations. What assumptions did you make going in? And I'd like to hear your experience once you got boots on the ground. Which of those assumptions turned out to be true, and what? What things kind of made you scratch your head and say, ah, maybe I'm not quite onto what I thought I was on here. So basically, how'd you adapt mm -hmm. to that trip from, you know, what you planned on initially? Yeah, and that's a great question because adaptation proved to be key. And that that was actually what helped me drastically throughout all my 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 kills this year was the the concept of adapting. And so I went into that hunt and I did a lot of research and and that's through many guys, many guys will kind of go about this method, but you know, watching YouTube videos, trying to get a feel for what the land looks like and stuff like that and what the tactics that have been working for other people are which surprisingly there's not a lot of early season bow hunting nebraska content in the kind of sand hill area that we were at there's some but there's not a whole lot and then it came to my my typical kind of e-scouting procedure I, I talked to the dnr and they told me there was a lot of pressure out there so i was looking for remote uh large pieces if i could but then also taking glances at small pieces adjacent to very large pieces of land. Um, I think that those, I mean, at least here in Wisconsin and a lot of other areas get overlooked a lot more than large pieces because a lot of times people like to 
do a lot of chasing one specific buck around. They think that no one else is going to be able to reach them in the large pieces. And around here, that's at least just not true. Like people go pretty much everywhere, no matter how far it is around here. But um, So I was told by the DNR it was going to be crazy pressure, but I knew that I might have the edge on some people because it was going to be like an average of a hundred degrees when I was there. Um, in many days it reached around the 110 mark. So I spent the day before and the first day of the season walking eight miles in 110 degree weather. And I was relying on that to get further back. And so what I did e-scouting is I looked a lot because I knew that heat was going to be very intense and that it was kind of an arid environment. There wasn't a whole lot of water. I looked for areas that had first and foremost good shaded sloping. So like Northwest facing slope. So it had the, the least sun exposure in the day held sun exposure to find sun exposure timing. I would look on Cal Topo. There's a sun exposure feature. You can dial it to a time of year and a time of day, and you can see where that shade is still hitting the latest. So those draws where it stayed coolest, the longest combined with water and combined with preferably a little bit of oaks, because there's not many oaks in that area. I thought it was going to just be a recipe for success. So if I could get a, a leeward wind, a lot of shade, quick access to water and that thermal that stays cool most of the day, and then they could drop down and have oaks, fresh white oaks. I was like, that's just got to be dynamite. That's got to be what's going to work. And it's far from access and a place that other people aren't willing to go. And those were kind of the assumptions I made. And so when I got there, um, immediately I found deer and draws like that. But I had bumped them and they just relocated extremely far away. And I wasn't certain of what kind of like had brought those deer there. Cause as I crested the hill to glass, uh, as you'll see in, in the video too, I just bumped them out from a distance. I never really got a feel for where they bedded and they walked down there. Were they going to bed? Like what was going on with them? And so then it turned into a lot of boots on the ground and doing a lot of extra walking. And what I kind of wanted to do in this case was because some of the cover was remote, I wanted to stalk my way into it with the wind in my favor and and really scout it hard. And if I had to bump a deer and use it as what I call like a sacrificial lamb, where basically I bump him um, close, and I know what kind of caliber deer I bumped. It's like it's a mature buck, right? And um, I wanted to make sure that I analyzed the exact situation that that deer was betting in, what advantages he was using, what he was feeding on, access, exit, all that. And a copy and paste that to a bunch of different situations. Um, and I thought this area would have the deer density to do that, where it doesn't always work in extremely low density areas. And so I was surprised when I found that even with rare or fresh dropping white oaks, they weren't eating. Like I did not find browse sign in a lot of these white oaks. I found that there was a bunch of white oak acorns on the ground and bur oaks and stuff like that, that had just gone bad and just sat on the ground. And I thought it was super weird. And even in all these situations, I was very rarely bumping deer. And because of the nature of the terrain being super open, they were seeing me from extremely far away, like places where I couldn't even make out what kind of deer they were. And they were seeing me just fine, which never would happen around here in like the hill country from the kind of distance we're talking about or even marshes and stuff like that. So it was very difficult to kind of go about that on the first property I chose out. And I also find that there was a lot of coniferous forests there, which provided shade, whether they were on a shaded slope or not and I found I bumped a lot of deer that I wasn't expecting to often does just under a random single tree and so I learned that you know I was spinning my wheels and I could try and get on some fresh sign and stuff there but I wasn't learning enough about the deer per encounter to make it happen so I started to shift properties and I focused on properties with large rivers that I focused on properties that had river bottoms and then again, oaks in those bottoms. And I started, instead of just going in and scouting it, I looked for properties that I could strategically glass from. And so I would sacrifice a morning sit where I might not get an attempt at a deer and I would glass and try to lay eyes and get a certainty of what deer are doing in that area. And that led to my first successful encounter where I got a shot at a buck. Um, and I, I guess I won't spoil that too much, but I didn't end up getting that buck. But I was like, all right, this is working, right? So after I felt that property was bumped out, I shifted yet again to another one. And this was far, far drive from where we were originally staying. And um, I did that same strategy again. I glassed in the morning and I ended up spotting like a 150s plus buck. It's just, just a stud. And um, I it was a very high wind day. I put a stock on him. I got up to three yards on him. And 
what I consider a very successful encounter. And um, it, it just started lining up where what I learned from that deer is they were betting on the edges of marshes and in very obvious to me cover that I didn't expect before. So his marshes provided a cool area. He wasn't browsing on oaks, but he was eating a lot of goldenrod. I watched him eat willows and I watched him eat a uh, wild sunflower. And they would just stand up in these beds on these just large cottonwood trees that was just looks super obvious to me from a map and stuff. Um, and just browse pretty much all day, but they were very safe because they weren't getting pressured. Whereas in Wisconsin, if you sat in an isolated tree in a marsh, there every limb on that tree would be hacked off and there'd be shooting lanes everywhere. Like it's just way too obvious for people out here. So that really made me check what I had to reanalyze what the deer would do because I had written off all these areas because I thought pressure would be getting to them. And the pressure really wasn't where I thought it was. It wasn't very I, in my opinion, very intelligent pressure. It wasn't like there was a lot of people out there even to start. So um, I learned from that encounter and eventually set up glassing again. And on my second spot stuck ever, my first one being on that 150 that I got up to in his bed, um, my second spot stuck ever, I ended up punching a tag on a nice little buck in Nebraska. Yeah. And so tons of stuff to unpack there. Yeah, first of all, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, you, that's good. That's good. The first thing I want to circle back to is you talked about one of the ways to go through a property and it sounds like maybe it didn't work as well, but I've had mm -hmm. a lot of success doing exactly what you said, where you walk into the wind on new properties and if you bump deer, you bump yeah. deer. And, and I have had some luck early season in lower pressure states like Nebraska, Montana, Kansas, uh, bumping those deer out and actually killing them the next day or they come right back. So I think that can be an effective <laughs> tactic, and and I talked about that some with uh, Justin Wright, but you have to you have to be real dialed in when you do that because usually if you bump them and then you come back in there and you sit that night or the next day, it's like yeah you, you get one more chance maybe two right. but usually one more chance and and then the jigs up so if, if you right. even get that one, um, so that mm -hmm. I thought that was a good point you made there, and then let's talk about so one you had a, a great stock and for people that don't want, go ahead and shout out your youtube right now <laughs> thank you yeah. yeah so my youtube is is the wild calling um it's the same thing on facebook and wild calling outdoors on instagram so little notifications that show you when a video drops on those platforms but everything's pretty much on youtube yeah and some of these hunts uh the nebraska one was on the hunting beast channel but i thought you did a better job in your edits and the videos you released mm -hmm. on your channel of you know showing more detail you, you have more time on your channel, obviously, than Dan had. He was Dan had he was trying to compile a bunch of uh, tons of different people that were out there. So we'll give him some some credit there, or some leeway, mm -hmm. I guess is the right word. But anyways, <laughs> um, so talk about that stock a little more. Um, how how did you spot that big buck? What was your approach like? And, and I wanted you to shout out your YouTube because you did a great job documenting that. But talk about Thank that you. as like a newer spot and stock hunter. I mean. It's one example, but it's a great example. And I'm sure there was a million lessons learned there for you. So oh, yeah. talk about maybe initially spotting that deer. How, how'd you plan to move in on your route being a first time spot and stock hunter? And what do you think worked? And, and how did you spot that buck that close? So there have been times before I kind of spotted deer with my eyes in woods and had to make a move on them just on like scouting trips in, in, in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. And I always err on the side of extreme caution, just like that deer will sense any bit of movement or anything like that. So I think that mindset has just helped me a lot. I've had successful stalks where I wasn't necessarily glassing like a spot and stalk that you'd think of. But I've had successful times that I've approached deer, I should say, before. And it's probably two or three times. It doesn't happen very often out there. But just going extremely slow has helped me a lot. And so the way it applied in this situation, the way it kind of started, was... I went out before sunrise and I got on a ridge that was a point overlooking this marsh. And it was not where I expected them to travel to feeding. And it was not skylit. So I could sit here and from 270, 290 degrees, they could not see me on this point in the sand hill. But I could see down in that marsh because my I was fairly well camouflaged. And so 
it was a very high wind day. So I had to be very diligent with the cover I was picking out because I wasn't just going to be able to pick out movement very easily. And so what I did was I took quick scans over the area and just saw if, you know, I could see it during the open, I could catch a little movement. That was my goal, just scanning left and right, layering up and down that cover. And um, I saw plenty of does and a couple small bucks doing that. But then I decided I really needed to dissect the cover that they could be betting in. And what I did is I very, very slowly panned my spotting scope and just stared for probably 30 seconds straight to a minute straight at a location that I think we'd be betting. And then I'd move the distance that I could, my field of view over, and I'd just do it again and again and again. And actually, like, five minutes into doing this, I ended up seeing a little bit of movement next to a tree, and I was like, holy crap, that's a buck. And so I got phone scope footage of this um, on my channel, but it's just a beautiful, he was actually an 11, um, and I'll tell you how I figured that out, but he's a mainframe 10, and just beautiful tall cage. Um, and I could see him ripping at a willow branch and I could just see his head poking out behind this giant cotton tree. And so I was looking at this buck. I was trying to see his behavior and he kept jerking his head around. And I was really worried that he had like been spooked by something. And so he disappeared behind the tree for a little bit, poked his head back out. And then eventually was looking around, swiveled his ears in front of him and quickly cut back behind that tree. And I kept looking around. I couldn't see him at all after that. And so I could see a little bit of land to the left and right of this tree, but I expected him to just have bedded down right there. Um, and he was on this little island that had two cottonwood trees that were about 15 to 20 yards apart. Um, and the wind direction was going from the tree that he bedded in right there, the, the tree that I last saw him in, I should say. So we'll say that was east. That was the eastern cottonwood. And the wind was coming from the east, blowing west to the other cottonwood 15 yards away. And so I was looking that direction and I could approach from the south here in this case. So what I did is even in my hiking boots, I decided I got to kill this deer. Like This is going to happen. This was the day after I had messed up and attempted another buck because I misjudged range. So I was like, I'm determined that I'm going to get this done. Like I, I just need to get in kill mode and I need to go get this deer. And so I was super confident on the way in and I was walking through this water in my little hiking boots, just getting soaking wet. And I was like, it doesn't matter. Like this is what I got to do to kill this deer. And I was slipping through cattails, keeping that wind perpendicular to where I was approaching. Cause I knew that if I went straight downwind of him, what I'd seen in hill country is they're often observing downwind of them. So I'd probably be going straight into his eyesight. Um, and if I went upwind of him, that's obviously bad. So <laughs> I don't want to get smelled. I don't want to get seen. I took that crosswind. And so i very slowly approaching that crosswind and I just got what I first did is I covered ground where I knew he couldn't see me as fast as I could and then I slowly approached I slowed up my approach when I believe I was somewhere within a very slight chance of eyesight and a very slight chance of earshot and the reason I covered that ground very quickly is I was just giving him opportunity to shift I didn't know it could take me an hour to cover those last 30 yards and I didn't want that to be the opportunity he had to shift where I didn't have a shot so it was important that I just covered that ground and then when I approached areas where I could bump him or I could bump another subordinate deer on the edge, I really, really slowed down. And I would take a couple steps and just pause for a minute and just stare at every little piece of cover. I would stare at where I thought he was, where he might have traveled to, and I would just stare. And I would, I'd move my head side to side like a doe trying to pick you out of the tree, essentially. So I'm getting a feel for my depth perception and stuff like that of what covers where. And eventually I worked up to the edge of this little island that these two trees are on and right now I'm standing south directly in between those two trees and so if they're 15 yards apart I'm seven and a half yards from the eastern one and seven and a half yards from the western one on the south side of this island um and so on this island is the cattails break and it immediately hits about a five yard wide patch of su wild sunflower that's over my head and then it extends to goldenrod that's about just under chest high, just probably belly button to chest high. And so when I got to the edge, I was ready to just sit there and be patient because I then was, if I were to walk directly in between these trees and be upwind of, of the Western one, um, I had probably 10 yards to go. So I was tight. I was really, really tight to where I thought he was betting. And so I was like, 
getting ready to perch up in these sunflowers and I practiced drew and I realized that I would be shooting into sunflowers pretty much wherever I turn. And that's just a very low percentage, high likelihood of deflection kind of shot. So I knew I needed to push past those sunflowers. And so I moved up uh, and this is just crawling, duck walking, like one little step at a time, pausing, letting that noise settle and taking another step, but it was ripping wind. So I knew I was getting away with the noise at this point. And when I edged up to the end of those sunflowers, what I did is I sat in the golden rod, I collected myself. I came to a full draw just in case he was standing and I drew and I faced where that bed that he was, was at. And it was just barely slightly uphill of me. And I faced that Eastern tree and I was like, I can't see antlers at all. Like, and, and I can almost see the ground here underneath that tree. And I was like, he's not there. Like I, I was certain he wasn't there. And that tripped me out. And I was wondering if he had just traveled away when I lost sight of him in line with that tree. So my, my goal was after I'd analyzed every other tree and every piece of cover and I couldn't see him, my goal was to work up and round downwind of him to the point where I could see the tips of his antlers and then possibly wait for him to stand from that point. Because if I just sat there all day and wasted one of the sec the second to last day I had left in Nebraska, I, I was throwing away an entire day for a buck that possibly wasn't there. And I had almost no confidence that he was going to be on that western side of the island. And so what happened was, after analyzing all that cover and deciding to move, I got to the point where I was just in between those trees. My wind was just off, blowing from my east, but just off of that western tree that was downwind of me. And I'm looking everywhere, and I look downwind, and all of a sudden I see his wrath. And he's four or five yards from me, right. maybe even closer. Dude, it was wild. And so <laughs> I see his rack, and I can see in person, I can see his entire neck and head. And, like, I can't. I, it's cut off at his neck where I can't see the base, so I don't see his body orientation. But what happened was is that western tree at the base of the root ball had just a one-foot lower dip in it. And he was sitting in goldenrod and wild sunflower amongst that dip. And so where I could see every other piece of land at antler height, that was just enough brush to cover. So no matter – I mean, I stared at exactly where he was bedded. I took video of it for probably five to ten minutes, and I never once saw him. So he was just like outside of view. And so in hindsight, I was probably being a little bit impatient here. I probably should have sat right on the edge of that golden rod or right on the edge of that golden rod and sunflower from the start and let him work up. But again, I let doubt creep into my mind and I, and I made myself think that I could be sitting here for a day, a deer all day that's not there. And so I, I saw him there. And so I was like, all right, it's going to happen here. It's got to happen here. So I came to full draw. And that's a, it's just a whipping wind and it's slightly off. And um, I can start to see his head swiveling around and stuff. And he's trying to pick out something, but he, he doesn't know where it's at. And I feel just a little breeze on my neck and that just a typical like 10 degree wind shift. That was enough to put my wind into him a little bit. And so what I did is I whistled because I knew he was smelling me. And I whistled to try to get him to be curious about the sound to like stand up because I knew I was already busted. And um, I whistled. He didn't even hear it in the wind. And then about 10 seconds later, he immediately bolted out of that bed. He didn't, I would, you know, I was waiting for him to stand. I could have tried to shoot him in the neck. There's not a lot of error that goes on at five yards for that. But at the same time, I was like, I want to make the most ethical shot. I'm all the way here. I might as well, you know, wait for the right opportunity. And uh, instead of standing up, like you a lot of times see deer do is stand up and turn towards you. He didn't see me at all, but he just straight bolted immediately in the opposite direction. And he actually ducked underneath a giant branch and there was absolutely no chance of a shot. I won't take a running shot at a deer, but even if I wanted to, there's no possible way to do it. And I was crushed because I had gone from the day before screwing up an opportunity to buck to being the absolute closest I've ever been to the biggest buck I've ever been on. And I've ever had a full draw opportunity on, I should say. And, um, and then just blew it. And I was just, dude, I was torn apart. But, but the things I really learned is just approaching on that crosswind was huge. Um, taking the time to analyze every bit of cover very well could have paid off for me. Huge in that case, covering ground quickly when you can, um, even if you lose track of a deer, you should hold confidence that he's there. I think that's very important. Um, 
and uh, just being as quiet as possible, recording everything you can if you do record so you can review it if you're uncertain. And then being patient on the edge instead of pushing a little bit too far. I think that's those are the like the really important takeaways and the things I learned from the stock. But I just think in general that the reason I did well in that stock is obviously the high wind helps like crazy. But my the nature of me having close attention to detail and sometimes being a little too like anal about details ended up helping me in this case with this this particular hunt. Yeah, and you made a great point about basically you got to have faith that that deer's there until you're absolutely certain it's not because I know it's happened mm -hmm. to me several times where you let a little doubt creep in or you think you know exactly where he's at, but it turns out when you move for a couple hundred yards or maybe 500 yards, you know, in a Western environment from mm -hmm. where you were, everything starts looking just a little different than what it looked like when you were glassing and you get up there and you said that doubt creeps in or it's not exactly where you thought it was and the next thing you know, that buck's up and running away. So uh, yeah. don't feel like you're alone there. That's happened to me plenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was a great, great example. And that was a great hunt. And again, we, we talked about your YouTube there, wild calling. If people haven't seen that footage, check it out. Super cool footage. And for people that are looking to get into spot and stock, especially Western one, it's a ton of fun. I mean, I'm oh, biased, yeah. but I think it's 10 times more fun than tree stand hunting. It's also very challenging though. So uh, oh, yeah. you, sound, you sound like a veteran there with a lot of the, the details that <laughs> you gave. So I think if you keep that up here, if you want to, you'll, you'll definitely find some success doing that. Well, it was, it was fun because I, I was crushed. That that was the morning hunt. And then the afternoon, I was super discouraged. And I was like, screw it. Like, this is this will be a theme <laughs> for this podcast, I guess. But I was like, why do you feel so sad? Like, why are you so sorry for yourself? Get back out there and, and make it happen. And so that afternoon, I went glassing again and, and ended up completing my second spot and stalk ever with some success. But I, I don't know if you want to go into that at all or if it was more just the lessons, but. Yeah, the lessons. No, and, and that's, I mean, uh, I do want to talk about that, but for a different reason. So mm -hmm. I think it's easy in this day and age to get tied up in big buck mania, especially if you're <laughs> a younger guy that's trying to uh, make a name for himself. Or, I mean, you're putting out content, right? So to mm -hmm. some extent, I mean, I do it for friends and family. I'm sure that's a big part of the reason you do to remember it. But there's some yeah. part of you um, and everybody that films, I think that it's, it's fun to put it out there, right? Like, yeah, look what I'm doing. It's fun. Mm -hmm. So, but you shot, obviously not, not a 150, right? You had an opportunity, you had a big <laughs> buck. It didn't work out, but you shot, yeah. but you shot your first buck out of state. And I think so many people could take something away from that, that it, it doesn't always have to be 150 inch or 200 inch buck, Absolutely. right? So talk to me about your decision to shoot the deer that you did and from my point of view, I think uh, it's great, especially on a first time out of state hunt to get a buck at all. So congrats on that. And yeah, talk us Thank through you. that a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, as you're alluding to, it, I guess not alluding to, but um, it the buck I shot is one I would 100% pass on at home. You know, he's a nice little basket rack eight. But um, I, I remember sitting there glassing and, you know, he came out and he was in a stockable position. And, and I say it. In the video like he's in a killable position um and i want to go after him for the experience and that is just that's why I hunt. you know i don't hunt to to say hey everybody look at me i don't hunt to to put out content i hunt to better myself through the pursuit of something challenging you know and, and that vehicle for that was wrestling for many many years and um it, it was never about winning championships it was about how good of a person and how hard of a worker can you become if you De dedicate absolutely every ounce of, that you have to this thing and so deer hunting is is that vehicle for me now and and in this hunt in this trip i had had such a rich experience and it was just it would mean the world to me to close the book on a good deer you know and so i ended up spotting this deer in a, a killable position and it was a situation where i could stalk him and i was very excited to get out and do that again and i was like i'm gonna go after him and so um you know, I went after this buck and I, I did a, this one was much more open terrain. Um, it was mostly wild sunflower and goldenrod. So I did a lot of crawling and stuff to get to this deer. Um, on, I had a camera set up on the ridge and I had a GoPro on my head. So I, you can see me crawling up to him and stuff. And um, on this particular deer, I, uh, I ended up getting him to about 10 yards and I, I drew back 
and he ended up going past a clearing a little bit before I was ready. And so he actually saw me moving. Uh, he, he didn't have my wind. I was approaching on a crosswind again. And uh, he, he blew off a little bit. So he blew and was spooked, but he wanted to get downwind of me and see, like, actually understand what it was because I'm in this tall goldenrod. And so I'm standing at full draw now, and I'm letting him work back downwind of me. And um, he, I had ranged my entire way up there. I, I learned from my failed attempt before that it's really important to understand the ranges that you're shooting, um, especially when you're a guy using a whitetail setup in a Western environment where I'm using a bit heavier setup. My pin gap's a little too great. In hindsight, if I had a little bit more money and time, I'd definitely be using a lighter setup when I'm out there on spot and stock hunts. But um, he ended up circling around to try to get down with me and figure out where I was. I judged him at 40 yards, which these deer are a little bit smaller bodied than what we have in Wisconsin. And uh, the cover is completely different. There aren't trees for reference and stuff like that. And um, I judged him at 40 and I watched the arrow zip maybe an inch over his back. And I was like, great. And um, he blew a bit, and then still he was about five yards away from being on my downwind line. And so he couldn't take that, and he still didn't see what was going on because I was holding very still. And I grabbed another arrow, drew back, and he turned around right as I finished getting the full draw, and I held draw for about a minute and change. And uh, he ended up circling to just about the edge of my, my uh, wind line. I squeezed off a shot knowing that he was realistically at 30 yards. And this shot with the correct judge range i put it through his heart both lungs and um actually got video of him falling on camera probably 10 15 seconds after i shot him and that was just an amazing experience i had gone through so much struggle and had such an awesome time just learning so much and it was a cool capstone to put on the trip and uh it, i had an amazing moment where i got, i got to call my dad and, and talk to him about getting one and he was like the person that just believed in me no matter what on that trip like I had given up faith in myself and and some of my friends certainly were not giving me the attaboys they started the trip giving me <laughs> and um it uh it was an amazing full circle experience and and uh it, I was lucky to be able to capture some of that emotion in the video and um yeah and even after that I could have gone home too and I actually was like I love it out here like I can't handle leaving a day early because I had one day left so I went out with Dan and Eric to, to scout an area. Um, and I said, you know what, like the, there's another patch of these isolated, um, cottonwoods on the other side of this marsh. It's even harder to get to than what I was at. I think it'd be really good. You guys should be able to sit there because it lines up right towards where that 150 was bedded. And Dan and Eric had scouted their butts off, quite frankly, and they were on some really good deer and some really good spots. And they had pr prior experience with those deer. So they went back and chased them. And I, they had pretty close experience that night, actually. But I um, I said, you know what, I'll go there tonight and I'll glass it because you guys have a few extra days more than I do. Um, and and I'll let you know what I see so you guys might have another spot. And so actually I went there to glass. And the first deer I saw at like 6 o'clock was another like big, big buck, like 140s plus buck. And he was probably 30 yards from the, the tree. I said, if you were going to set a stand in, you should be in that tree. And, you know, it doesn't always work out like that. It's very rare, but it was cool as an affirmation point to see using the pattern that you saw before applied in another situation to see that work again was great. And that just was like a bit of a confidence booster, especially leading into my Wisconsin season. No, it's a lot of great stories and a lot of good takeaways. I want to circle back to something you said, because coming from the Midwest, this is something that I struggled with and it's probably one of the best tips I can give people. If you're going to do any ground hunting and you're used to the Midwest where there's trees and then you get out to the West where there aren't, it's so hard to judge distance and probably one of the best things you can do. And it sounds like you were able to range sometimes, but I find myself in situations a lot where by the time you get within range, you're scared to move or th that animal yep. locked on you, or, you're, or maybe you're already at full draw because you had to be. So some unknown mm -hmm. distance um, range estimation where you don't have any any like firm landmarks like trees or the things you would be used to in the Midwest. Like I said, the right. deer are a little different size. So it's very challenging. And, and I've had a, an issue or two myself there. So that's a that's a really mm -hmm. good point that you brought up there about judging distance out West if you're from the Midwest. It, it's difficult. It's different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I arranged everything on the way in there. Like I, I purposely 
was was checking areas from up top and doing a little bit of mental math to try and figure out distances between points from like the angle I was at, the distance I knew I was at. And um, I was doing as much as I could on the way in there. But when he bumped off and circled up wind like that, or circled downwind, that was like the end of all the ranging I could have done in that area. So I was like, you know, and I, and I did practice that a lot before I went out there. I, I bought a Morel cube target would throw it out and guess ranges at my yard. And, and I was doing well in that, but backyard or even just grass that I would throw it in, is just nothing like, like out West. It's and like you said, the deer size is a huge thing too. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Yeah. And then you talked about resilience and uh, it's, easy because i think again social media especially on <laughs> public land you think oh i'm gonna go out here there's gonna be these deer i'm gonna get you know in a week i ought to get four or five six opportunities and sometimes that's how it works out but sometimes it's like you struggle to even see deer or you struggle for one opportunity and it's easy to uh abandon that positive attitude so talk to me a little bit more about that and it sounds like honestly from my perspective you had the perfect hunt because you learned early on as a as a young and developing hunter that it can happen on the last day or towards the end of the trip, and that's a that's a super important lesson because I know uh, I know several people where if it doesn't happen in the first two three days, they they start questioning things pretty quick. Yeah, that's the way I'd love for it to go. Honestly, too, is because I just like I said, I'm, I'm obsessed with the learning. It's not all about punching a tag for me. So it's like I love getting as rich of an experience as I can, as much as it hurts to like essentially fail on a very cool spot and stuck on what would be your biggest buck ever what, what would have been my biggest buck ever um that hurts but you know it's still an amazing experience like i got it's so cool to say i got within four yards of a giant buck bet it you know like not many people ever do that and you know i got to do that on my first out of state trip ever so I, that's what i what i try to do and it's very hard i'm very used to doing that i guess because and, and just again in wrestling it's like you have to you have to do stuff that feels like you're not going anywhere but you have to just trust that process of getting beaten to the ground over and over again and taking your lumps and learning and then eventually you come out on top and kind of what helps me as a vehicle to stay positive and to keep pushing on is when i went through like some severe concussions and stuff like that i had a coach that was fantastic and he would always tell me to not be discouraged by the things I can't control, but to be encouraged by the things I can. And so to me, I couldn't control that I screwed up that opportunity anymore. I couldn't control anything that happened about those previous hunts, but I could control learning from it. I could learn all the things I did wrong. I could apply them to my better hunts. I could not sit and mope around for the day. I could be determined and go find another deer. I could make the most of the time I had left but there's nothing I could do about what happened in the past. There's no use in me wasting time and energy on that. And it's like, you can be upset about your last few days and lose confidence, but what is it going to return you? Like it's, it's returning you nothing. It's making your hunt worse, if anything. So it's like, I only got so much time off. I only got so much money and, and resources to be out here. I'm going to take advantage of every little bit I can. I can, cause that's what I can do. And, and that's what kind of like pushes me through those things. And I really just kind of, I, I talk to myself a lot more harsh than you'd probably be able to say on a podcast, but um, it's stop being a, you know what, and get back out there and do it. Right. You know, that's, that's how I talk to myself. And and that was a, that was certainly a reoccurring theme, especially for my Wisconsin. Book. Yeah. It's easy to feel bad. And, uh, but like you said, it doesn't do anything good. And, and almost always your best results come from just Repeat the program, right? Get out there. You know mm -hmm. what works. Get out there. Repeat the program. Repeat the program. Repeat the program. Yeah. And, and that's usually when the results happen. So, well, let's talk about something that I don't know if you've thought about this or I'm, I'm sure you have to some degree, but let's put this in the next question in, in two different scenarios. One, we'll talk, uh, maybe think about Nebraska or your next out-of-state hunt. And then the second part mm -hmm. I want you to think about at home in Wisconsin. So you're still a relatively young guy right how old are you 24 24 so okay so you're pretty young, young. <laughs> I'm, I'm old i'm 40 so i'm ancient now um, <laughs> yeah, right. you're you're gonna be as you challenge yourself and it sounds like that's a big part of the reason why you like deer hunting is it's a, a good vehicle as you said to challenge yourself if you want to challenge yourself and you want to target older age class or, or higher scoring deer you're gonna have to pass more and more more deer so have you given any thought to that so let's go back to Nebraska, 
how would you decide what deer that you want to pass, if any, and uh, not pass any deer is a perfectly fine answer there. Mm -hmm. And then your home state of Wisconsin, we'll get to it, but you shot a real nice buck this year. How's that going to impact your decision moving forward? So maybe talk about those as two separate answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I really enjoyed having out of state trips this year because it allowed me to, in this case, at least get a deer on the ground before I went into my home state. So I, I really like, going out and just having a fun hunt, being a little less selective on an out-of-state trip and and getting some venison in the freezer really and um, just having a great experience. And that allows me to take a little bit more punishment at home, I think. And so I do hold a stricter standard for myself at home, but to me, out-of-state, um, what I really like is just something on the edge of the ears or outside it. I like it to have an eight-point frame or some kind of cage. You know, if there's a giant six, I'll take it. But like, but like I, it's not really a numbers thing. It's just like a, a quality or size of animal is what I like to see. And, you know, maybe there's a two-year-old that is an exception. Um, and that might be a little different. I might choose to pass on that, but I would like to shoot a three-year-old or better and wherever I go. And that adjusts depending on, you know, if I'm going to Louisiana or if I'm going to Alabama or Florida, that deer is probably a lot smaller than if I went to Iowa, you know, but um, when I'm in just a over-the-counter state like that, like my goal is to just suit something on the ears, 115 class or better, you know, and, and have a great experience. That deer I might pass on the first few days all day long, and I might shoot them on the last day. And a lot of people say, well, don't pass on something the first day that you would be happy with on the last day. And I just completely disagree because I, I don't care about just having an animal. Like I don't want to just kill something to kill something. Like I... I want to have a rich experience. If I kill a 115 on the first day, like, and that's, you know, maybe not what I want to take necessarily. It's not my goal heading into it. Then I've robbed myself of all the extra learning that I could have had. I've robbed myself of the experience I can have with friends in this new state. You know, I I've learned myself. I've, I've robbed myself of that experience really. And that's what I care about. So yeah, I mean, I mean, out of state, I'm probably going for something 110, 115, you know, or better if I had to put a number on it. But in state, I ended up killing an, a pretty nice buck this year. And um, I'm not going to be one of those guys that's just adamant that he's going to kill a bigger one every single year. Um, but my goal is to have some level of success in the year and then focus on one deer in state. And this was the first year I had done that. I typically just shoot like the first 130, 125, something like that or better. Um but I really, really learned a lot about myself and I really challenged myself more than ever chasing a specific deer. Um, I learned a lot about the intricacies of one deer's behavior. I learned a lot about how much they, I mean, just for example, like how much they dodge trail cameras, how much cell cameras can screw you up more than help you. And in many cases, especially with this first year that I was chasing in Wisconsin. And I guess what you're, what you're alluding to partially here too, is that like, for those of you that don't know, and I cover this in my video a little bit, there was a really, really big 12 pointer that I was chasing. That was Boone and Crockett status on some public land. And, um, I focused my entire season on him. And the day I killed in Ohio, he got killed in Wisconsin and I had four days left to hunt and I had to identify another buck. And I was left with the decision. Do I just go after one of these typical bucks that I shoot every year, you know, and granted, I could have taken it easy on myself because I was in completely new terrain. Um, but do I go after what I've been doing all this time or do I choose to try and grow and continue to make it harder on myself, harder than it has been in past years at least because it's never easy. And I chose to pick out the next biggest buck I realistically think I could have targeted and then go after him. And I ended up you know, eventually getting it done. I want to take a minute to mention huntingbeastgear.com. Co-founded by the big buck serial killer himself, Dan Infault. Hunting Beast Gear features state-of-the-art manufacturing techniques, the highest quality materials, and innovative designs that have been engineered, field-tested, and refined to perfection by a group of the best mobile hunters on the planet. www.huntingbeastgear.com delivers cutting-edge products, including Beast Gear climbing sticks with weight reduction holes designed to deliver incredible durability in a lightweight stick. Beast Gear climbing sticks also feature non-staggered inline stacking and double steps, all in a 2.2-pound package, including the fastening strap. HuntingBeastGear.com has also released the game-changing Beast Gear Hang-On Tree Stand. Designed to be the ultimate hang-on tree stand solution, with over four years of prototyping, testing, and refinement, 
The B-Skier stand features a 16-inch wide by 29-inch long platform. The stand comes in at an incredible 6.8 pounds, and it does all that without compromising strength or durability. The B-Skier stand is finished with a long-lasting anodized coating and features grade 8 hardware, high-quality Delrin washers, beast buttons, and adjustment knobs. For more details and to place your order today, head on over to www.huntingbeastgear.com. Now, back to the podcast. Well, you brought it up, and that was something I wanted to talk about. So let's talk about that first buck, the typical 12. You had that deer on camera. Um, I think you had snuck me a, a picture of that deer and said on, on a blood oath, don't share this with anyone. And, uh, yeah. and I didn't. But let's talk about that deer before we move on. And you mentioned something there that I'd be interested in. I don't use cell cameras. I know tons of people that do. Um, super popular, more popular than ever. And you said that they can mm -hmm. hurt you. So I'd like to know overall, would you learn from that whole experience specifically? And then maybe touch on your comment on the cell cam. What would, you know, dive into that. What do you mean there? Yeah. So I guess, and there's a lot of guys that are super anti cell camera nowadays. And like, and there's a lot of guys that just love them and deploy out a hundred of them and whatnot. And it did just clear the air and where I stand on that. Cause I guess it's such a controversial thing nowadays. It's like, I, I don't love, using them in particular um but i felt like i could use some actual intel from this year um during this season and so i use them a bit this year and i i just think it's another tool i think it's like a saddle or or a tree stand or you know whatever bow you decide to use or something it's another tool in your toolbox that can be used appropriately and inappropriately and you know i wasn't deploying much of these i had two of these where I ended up killing my deer, not, not in a specific area or anything, but I'm not like coding an area with them, but because I'm going into a brand new type of terrain and with absolutely no historical data, I felt that they would be something I could leverage this year. And I've learned the downfall of that. So basically this area that I ended up identifying this 12 in was an area that I thought was really good. I spring scouted it. And I remember telling um I told my girlfriend actually it was like this is the best thing I thought I'd been busting my butt I ended up scouting over 300 miles this off season like just in marshes and stuff and this was about midway through and this was the best thing I found and I was super confident in it and I had placed a cell camera there and um I wasn't getting I was getting decent deer but I wasn't getting anything giant on the cell cam and the cell camera was on a exit of bedding, an exit of buck bedding, heading towards doe bedding with just lit up rubs in front of where the cell camera was. So to me, glaringly obvious. And it was on a very thin strip of land that seemed impassable except from this particular end of it. And so I was like, well, the concentration is right here. Like there's the buck sign, there's everything I need. Like this is gonna be a great area. Um, and I thought it was gonna be like a pre-rut scenario because it's rubs from buck bedding going towards doe bedding. And so, Almost every time when I got pictures of him, I wasn't getting mud on his hooves. And on a lot of areas here, he had the option to bed or cross areas that he would get extremely muddy. So I was able to learn a little bit about him in particular, where he might be bedding because he lacked that when a lot of other deer had it. And I also learned that when he crossed in front of that cell camera in particular, that he was, besides that first occurrence, he was only doing it when a younger buck was around there. He would almost always come in with his ears pinned or when he was pushing a doe. And that was in even in the early season when he was doing that. And that was the only time he stepped in front of that camera. And I figured out I figured out the error in this way because um, I approached that area on an off wind and I waited for about 30 minutes for a wind switch to happen. So I had to access from a different direction. And once that wind switched, I could continue. Well, I actually passed that cell camera and I never wanted to pass it because I thought I would push deer off of it if I put my scent in that area. So I passed that camera and accessed up that thin strip of land that I believed was impassable and had no sign on it previously. And every single tree on that thin strip leading up was rubbed to hell, like absolutely torn up. And through just nasty briar and cattails and everything, four new trails were ripped right behind that cell camera. And you could clearly see that he was just, a, he was using it all the time, but he was going straight behind that camera. And so I was just, I, I was completely led astray by it and it, and it screwed me over. Um, and then there's even more, we'll touch on this more too, when we get to the buck I actually ended up killing, but, um, that had, had messed me up pretty bad. And so 
um, when I started diverting from wondering about those pictures and I started using more woodsmanship, I got on that deer a lot more. Um, I was able to do a, I did a scout trip in which I placed two SD cams in desperation. If he were to shift off of that core range, if I were to push him off. And the only reason I placed those cameras there, cause I did some in season scouting and I found different isolated cover that matched up to what he liked to do, which was, uh, he liked to bed in fragmites amongst cattails. So like he would be in an isolated elevated patch of fragmites and never cross in or out of those cat. He would never leave those cattails in daylight. He would, enter them before legal shooting and leave them after legal shooting. And I saw him do this on several occasions. Um, but I, through that extra scouting, I found that he liked fragmites. I found that he made very tiny telltale rubs. And um, I placed some cameras to try and catch that shift in desperation. And these were just SD cams. And I was like, if I completely lose them and the sign dries up, I'm going to use those. And so there were a few times I watched him go to bed. I watched him exit. I made a couple really risky kind of um aggressive stabs at him and i believed i bumped him out i gave him a day's rest and i went to go check those cameras and do what i planned was all day boots on the ground scouting and i had found that he had shifted 600 yards away to one of those areas i had scouted out and found in desperation and um you know i'm leveraging cameras pretty heavily here because i was after that specific deer and it's the first time i've ever done that um but i found that he had done that the day before and I had a very tiny window in which I could target him. Um, long story short, it didn't work out because it got ruined by another hunter. He actually came into four yards after after daylight. I have audio of him walking straight up to me while I'm at the base of my tree, packing up my sticks. And I was incredibly depressed. Um, I could see his antlers and stuff in the in the dark, but I can't cat. I didn't capture any of it on my phone. I just have the audio of it. And um, yeah, I could I could literally hear him sniffing and breathing and stuff. It was just. It was, it was wild. Um, and after that bump, I found a little bit more of a sign, but it was time to go to Ohio. Um, and so really what got me back on this deer multiple times was deciding to do in-season scouting, deciding to try and find his track and, and track and get experience with what kind of sign he left down and then repeat on it. And whenever I could, like I employed in Nebraska, just observing as much as possible. And now it's very hard to do in cattails that are nine feet tall, but um, just little pieces of affirmation on what his track looks like going in and out of areas. And um, if I happen to get a, a sighting of him, that that affirmed that what I had find, found scouting was truthfully his sign, him shifting around. A lot of good takeaways there too. Uh, some of the things you mentioned about the, the specific details in the trail camera, like looking for the mud on the hooves, small details, right? But those can tell you a lot about what is or what is not happening. So great attention to detail there and then anticipating a potential shift because everybody knows bed hunting, that's a dicey game, right? The closer you get, yeah. the more likely you are to bump that deer. And that's just reality. But but to have the forethought to have some cameras in likely or high odds areas near his home range, really, really intelligent play there too, I think. So good tips. Thank you. Well, Thanks. let's uh, let's just in the interest of time, because we're, we're about, you know, couples in an hour. Let's talk about Ohio quickly, but I want to I want to spend most of the rest of the podcast talking about uh, this year's Wisconsin buck. So, give me like your top three takeaways from Ohio in in five minutes. What'd you learn down there? Yeah, yeah, I'll zip I'll zip through it. I know I'm a long winded guy, but um, no, it's good. Uh, a lot I, of, and a lot happened this year, and a lot of lessons learned. So it's it's great to convey yeah. those. Yeah, absolutely. So I learned in Ohio, um, it's it's a very different game and steep hill country with with very narrow tops. Uh, in very low deer density, whereas where my experience in previous hill country was wide open, flatter tops um, and high deer density. I learned that um, it's very conducive during the peak peak seeking and pretty pretty high chasing stage of rut, which was at early November, um, that it it's very smart to actually sit habitual spots, sit spots over and over again, which it didn't really work very well in Wisconsin, like just sitting a funnel over and over again. Because uh, you bump one deer, two deer, the deer shift out of that area, uh, especially if you sat in there. The, the bucks usually cruise by at night and they smell your ground scent and they're they're gone. You usually have waning success the more days you sit in a row, uh, with the exception of younger deer. You know they'll they'll come by, but um, I, I found a lot of deer and deer even of good quality in Ohio were repeating on areas, and that's because they're running very very large groups on 
routes on these huge ridge systems where they would do a mile and it'd take them all day to work this giant loop, just a mile in each direction. And so there were often times that bucks were covering brand new areas that they had never smelt the following day after. And so once I figured that out and I, you know, with granted a lot of help from Jake Bush, who I was hunting with, um, because obviously it's a lot of great experience around there, uh, identified a spot that I thought it was conducive to sit multiple times. And on the last morning opportunity that I had, uh, ended up getting it done on a, a beautiful eight pointer out there and just had a really, really rich experience with him. You made a great point, And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand or understand as well as they should. Uh, deer density matters. And I think Ohio hunts mm -hmm. in some ways and in a lot of ways different, but in the density way, mm -hmm. it hunts a lot like Kansas. So I've hunted in Kansas, yeah. I don't know, four years now, um, since 2016, I think it was the first time I went, mm -hmm. but it's, it's similar. And I hunted Southern Ohio. One of my bucks came from Southern Ohio and it's uh it's an important point. Exactly what you said. It's easy in high density areas, Michigan, Wisconsin, where the deer herds are large to, large to burn an area out. It, it, I think especially during the rut and especially in hill mm -hmm. country, where terrain features are so dominant over any sign you're going to see to to sit high odd spots because like you said that deer might only come through there once every two days three days four days you might have deer in that area that's they're only there for the rut and they're i mean if you had to stand there three four days they don't know that's their first time coming through and maybe they only come right. through there two or three times a year so it's a it's a lot more effective tactic in low density areas so great point there yeah thank you well, let's move on to Wisconsin. Uh, you just released the video Friday. I've checked today. It's doing great numbers. So congratulations. Always <laughs> exciting when, when you're doing YouTube content, you get one that takes off and, and for good reason. Uh, great video, great footage, great story, and great buck. So um, without giving any more away than what's already shown on the video, I'd be real curious about your access for that hunt. I think access is super critical any time of the year. Um, that looked like a relatively small patch of cover that you set up on the outside. So mm -hmm. talked about that. Was that predetermined access? Had you pre-scouted that area? Did you have a tree picked out? So talk about access and tree selection for that one specifically, and then maybe your philosophy in general on those two things. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was waffling between if I was going to go set up where I had intel on him, um, where I had scouted a whole bunch, or I was going to go to this other area that was around 250 yards away. And um, I knew that it was important in this case not to rely, like I had learned from that individual book, where I had gotten a picture of a cell camera 250 yards away from where I ended up sending. Um, I knew it was important not to just rely on that and not to just hope you would reappear and hunt a camera because I had seen that downfall happen already. And I knew that I had a, a doe and heat work back into that cover. And um, I knew that it was it was important for me to scout my way in and identify where he was going to be and where she was going to be. And them, those two deer locked together were going to emerge out. And so I, I accessed my way in it was a lot of just steep water and cattails on the way in and, um, following deer trails. And I had the option basically to cut towards, you know, the place where I had pictures of him, or to cut towards where I thought he was going to come up. And, and it was really, I took probably a 30 yard leap of faith to work and scout my way towards that other section that I had no experience with spring scouting. And I ended up coming across a, a doe bed and that doe had fresh estrus in it and it reeked and it was just glaringly obvious. And so I sat there for a minute, I looked at my map and I kind of figured where would she go back into, what kind of bedding has this buck used in the past and where do I think that they would hold up together if they were locked onto each other and then come out of again in the afternoon and it narrowed it down pretty quickly for me. And I worked that trail back and I got to the point where, like you said, I was on a very isolated tree, just absolutely skylit, single tamarack. And uh, looking back into where I thought he would be bedded with her. And um, it was really just like scouting my way in, learning from before that, you know, a camera is not the thing that you just should be hunting, you know, and, um, and, and just not, I don't know. I, I feel like it's so easy for people to get locked in these traps of if the camera's not showing something they shouldn't be hunting there. And um, I had committed to hunting this deer instead of just going for, for whatever was out there. Cause he was the second biggest one I had an opportunity at. And um, 
and honestly, in those marshes like that, I like seeing. Like, I don't love seeing cell cameras because obviously it's more intrusion. But I know that when there's cell cameras in isolated areas, that especially from what I learned this year, like there's a lot of times those guys are not hunting them and they're just waiting for something to show up on the camera, and the deer are just skirting right around them. And I've had plenty of success, and you even see this in some of my videos where I'll get in a spot and I know it's the spot and I've had it before where I've literally been on my way up the tree and seen a cell cam before. And I've just been like, well, that guy's waiting for that camera to work and I'm hunting the sign here. And I know that it's time. You know, I know from my scouting that it's time to be here and he's might get a picture of the buck I'm about to kill today, but I'm going to kill him before he wants to go in and sit on it. And I trust that he hasn't gotten what he would have in here. Otherwise I would have seen the human side coming in. So, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot about how that can kind of create your downfall a little bit. And, and scouting my way in, in this case, was absolutely the difference maker, whether I was going to get this deer or not. That's awesome. The uh, attention to detail, too, there. It, and, I mean, I know what you're talking about, not specifically with a, a doe estrus bed, but I've been on hunts where in the fall, I mean, a lot of times, I don't know why to me, it just smells like rut in general. But I've been on areas like on a, especially – like a high humidity morning where you'll walk through an area and you can smell that, like a rutted up tarsal mm -hmm. gland walk through there and you're like, Oh, okay. The tarsals are just like, it's like they just spray everywhere. It's crazy. It's just yeah. such a vivid smell. Yeah. So you, and like I said, especially when it's humid out and like good scenting conditions, I mean, it's so obvious you, you can smell it as a person. So I know what you're talking about, about smelling that smell during the rut. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it sounds like a lot of what's the word I'm looking for here like deductive reasoning right you're you're mm -hmm. saying i've got a lot of the pieces of the puzzle what what would make these pieces make sense and, and you ended up where you did and, and obviously that was a great decision because that's where they were and obviously it doesn't always work out like that but you have to go with what you think are are the best odds and the best information you have available at that time and and it sounds like you're learning already and i talked about this a lot with andy may when andy may was on about basically like developing your gut and your gut is just the accumulation mm. of all your experiences. And it's kind of a self-correcting mechanism where if it doesn't work, you're less likely to do it. And if it does work, you're more likely to do that thing again in the future. And, and over time that gets pretty powerful. Yeah. I remember hearing him talk about, and this has helped me a lot, but I remember hearing him talk about um, pushing that envelope and, and being wrong and that's okay. Like it's okay to, to go too far and push it wrong. You just take it and you learn and you adapt and that's just like a huge derivation of my strategy is from him. Um, you know, it, and I, and I've talked about cameras a bit in this podcast and I would really love to get away from them entirely. Um, at this point, I just see them as a good opportunity for me to get a certain verification, like a seeing a deer is a certainty that it was there, that a specific animal was there. And I think I have a lot to learn yet before I completely write off the opportunity I have to learn from cameras. But I totally respect Andy and the, just the way that he uses his woodsmanship and he's honed that instinct over time. Um, I would say I trust pretty much everything that comes out of that guy's mouth. And I can't say that for a lot of people in the industry. Um, yeah. But um, he is absolutely right when he says, scout your way in, pay attention to detail. Like th that's why he's so effective is because he just doesn't set up if it's not perfect. And he makes sure that he keeps going until he, creates or is in the right situation and that's just such a beneficial thing and the other thing i want to talk about this uh, wisconsin buck and i was reading the comments i think you only got one but maybe you'll get more let's talk about the shot you took now i'm not judging you but i imagine you've already caught a little flag for that you probably catch a little more so in uh maybe as a, a chance to justify or defend yourself here one how far was the shot let's talk about your broadhead setup let's talk about have you made a shot like that before and something that's important to me and a lot of people might roll their eyes at this it's like do you butcher your own deer because if you do i feel like guys that do have a way better understanding of deer anatomy than than guys that don't so go ahead and uh let's i'll just reiterate those how far was it broadhead set up do you butcher your own deer how'd you feel and, and why'd you take the shot mm -hmm. so i i butchered my own deer yes yeah <laughs> i'll get good we'll, we'll talk about that again but um so the shot was 19 or 20 yards. I had ranged everything in advance. Um, I'd seen the trail that he was coming down, and the trail that Joe that he was following had gone down. Um, I use a 125 grain G5 Montec. Um, 
broadhead. It's a cut on contact three blade. Um, I have a 95 grain outsert on my arrow and I use a micro diameter VIP arrow. Um, it's their carbon stainless steel model and, um, shoot 75 pounds and 29 inch draw length. And so my, my total arrow weight is, uh, 540 grains. And, um, yeah, so he was at, uh, 20 yards. Um, as you can see in the video, that doe was going in front of him. Um, I guess I'll touch on your last question. I, I do butcher my own deer. I butchered my own deer for the last seven years straight. And that's mine and my friend's deer. And I'm almost always the one to gut it and do all of the taking the meat off of the deer itself. And my friend, usually when we were in college, he would do this, the trimming and we had a very good system for that. But yeah, the understanding the anatomy, I think is a huge point. And I don't hear that talked about enough. So I, I commemorate you for, for talking about that because it does make a huge difference. Um, yeah, I've taken shots on deer like that. I've taken shots that have been actually at a steeper quartering too than that. Um, and I think it's also important for people to know that the camera's at a very different angle than I am because it's self-filmed. The camera's below me and to the side of me. So it's 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 different than what you see on camera. Um, but uh, I will say it was a steep quartering two angle, yes. Um, and I practice religiously 50 to 100 shots every day in the summer. Um, I practice holding my draw for as long as I possibly can and then refocusing and making a shot. And that's not just a timing thing. I practice literally as, until I feel my arms are close to giving out and I force myself to refocus and take those shots. I practice after running for five miles, I'll immediately pick up my bow and make a shot. Like I'll practice those elevated heart rates. So yeah, in tree stands too. I put myself in all these realistic conditions because I think it's very crucial. And, and I do a lot of visualizing of the shot too. I don't, it's, I get in a very good headspace when I'm bound to make a shot. But uh, that preparation helped me a lot in this case. So basically that doe was working in and she they were moving at a snail's pace and she picked me out immediately up that tree. And um, and I moved my bow cam in front of my face. I squinted my eyes. I did everything I could to stay still so that she wouldn't spook off and ruin this opportunity. And um, I expected her to come on a trail right underneath me as I had outlined a little bit earlier in the video, I drew a dotted line that showed the trail that I expected the deer to continue on, which was leading back towards that bed that the doe had made when she was bed down in the heat. And um, when she saw me, she got a little bit sketched out and eventually she worked forward and lowered her head and I drew back because I knew that if she walked underneath me, if I tried to draw, it was going to be over. That she'd be gone, the buck would be gone, end of story. And so she worked out into that clearing at 30 yards, worked to about 25, and then instead of going underneath me, cut off and up. And by the time she started to get her head behind cover and I could think about dawn drawing and drawing again, I started to see the buck coming in. So at this point, I was at about a minute and a half of draw, which I had done many, many times before. Um, not, not on a deer, but on a target, again, elevated heart rate, all that stuff. And so the buck continued to work in. He stopped and sniffed where she had been standing and worked in really slow. And um, I'm adamant that I don't take a shot when I'm too shaky. If I can't settle the pen, I don't shoot, period, like ever. Um, I'm, I'm never going to be a guy that that has that happen. I, I eat myself up over every time I've ever injured an animal. I hate that I could even say that I missed a deer in, in Nebraska. It, it just hurts me. I hate it. Um, but with that being said, I was at two minutes and 20 seconds when I stopped him and touched that trigger off. And he was at a good quartering to angle. And one guy did mention that in the comments, but, but he said, you know, we, we talked about it. And basically I, I was, I, I, what I did to prepare for this shot was uh, I got, I completely stopped looking at his rack and I moved to judging his body position. Once I knew it was a deer, I would shoot. And I knew it was that 10 that it was after. Um, I, I completely moved to judging his body position, his demeanor. Was he spooking? Was he seeing me? Uh, was he relaxed? What was he thinking about? Was he on that doe or was he coming down the trail that he was going to go towards, towards me? Was he going to follow that doe? Um, I think about, I thought about all that stuff. And so when I finally got him to stop again, he's at a little more broadside than angle than the camera shows. But um, I, I looked out from behind my peep to be certain of his body angle. And that's something I'd, I'd learned in Ohio where I had a deer stop and move his front shoulders, but not the rest of his body turned out to my advantage in that case but I was frustrated that I made a tiny bit of a misjudgment on his angle 
And so I looked out from my peep and out of my sight housing and made sure the deer was truthfully at the angle that I believed. And I settled that pin. And to be honest, I was rock solid. Like my arms were shaking before, but when I was on that deer, I was absolutely rock solid. And I I remember thinking about my mechanics and very slowly squeezed off that shot. And um, to, to, I guess, spoil it for people, the shot went in perfectly just behind his shoulder, went the entirety of the length of his lungs, went out just behind the last rib. So it cut the entire distance of his front lung and the majority of his back lung. And um, he went 30 yards and died 15 seconds after I shot him. And I have him getting shot, running, and falling. Yeah, and it was a perfectly executed shot, but that's one of those things where, one, I think uh, – a lot of people will give you flack if it's not a textbook broadside shot. And to me, I'm, I know a lot of people that have made that shot. I haven't shot any deer quarter two that I can recall. Shot several deer quartered mm -hmm. away, which which is my favorite shot, really, but even more than mm -hmm. broadside. But if you know the anatomy of the deer and you are confident, I mean, 20 yards, right? That's not that's not a 35-yard shot. There's a lot yeah. more things that can go wrong there. I think 20 and in. I practice at 60 a lot and it's not because I ever would shoot a deer at 60, but it's because I want to be effective at 40. So it's like to your, to your point too, like, like I, I try to deliberately put myself under much more rigid conditions. And I think what you're alluding to is I wouldn't ever recommend that someone necessarily shoot under those exact same conditions, but I spend my entire year in life preparing for those situations as well. Well, and I think it's a matter of being informed too, right? Like True. knowing so, so I've, I talk about this with my friends a lot. When you take a broadside shot, you've got the largest margin for error. When you take a, mm -hmm. a, a quartering two or, or maybe a, a more non-conventional frontal shot from the ground, for example, you've got a smaller right. window and you have to be more confident in your shooting. You have to be more confident in the body language of the animal because mm -hmm. your margin for error, it's just, it's just smaller. That's, that's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. But if you feel like the situation and, and the conditions are right, then, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not here to judge you. I was just bringing it up for the sake of, of discussion. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about that too. And there's absolutely shots I won't take, no matter how confident I am in me hitting a mark, there's absolutely shots I won't take. Like, I'm not a fan of frontals, but in a lot of different angles as well. So, well, those are uh, probably a little different questions than you got from, from some of the other podcasts. And, and I don't want to rehash the entire hunt because one, I advise everyone to go watch the video. It's a great video. And two, if you want to hear more from Jacob in detail, uh, and I don't mind, shout out. You've been on one or two or three other podcasts recently, and I'm sure you've talked about this in more detail than those. So if you want to drop any of those names in there where people could hear the whole story on this particular hunt, go ahead and do that. Yeah, I was on the – oh, thank you. That's actually very selfless of you, too. That was kind of um, – uh, I am I have one that's going to be dropping on East Meets West Hunt, Bill Martonic. Um, fueled by the outdoors with uh chris lepper and josh luck and, and uh, all those guys and i had just recorded one for the wisconsin sportsman um so yeah in those areas you can hear the story i think you're absolutely right jeremy it's, it is best watched i i believe it the, the video does a good job but i i do have to say i really appreciate you asking me different questions and, and making me think about it too and i think it's really important that we don't always just talk about the story we we talk about what you learn from it and and how it can help other people. Cause that's certainly what I gained from when I was learning as much as possible about this. Yeah. That's what I like to discuss. I try to keep things a little different on this podcast. I know you've listened off and on. So try to ask oh, yeah. maybe questions that aren't super conventional. Um, like I said, the video speaks for itself and, and I know you've talked about the story. So I want to ask uh, two or three more questions here and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So uh, one, congratulations again, Three bucks this year, got to be a great feeling. I've, I've had a couple of years like that, and boy, it's it's hard not to smile and ride the high <laughs> when when those because everybody knows it doesn't always go that way, and and you'll have ups and downs. But congratulations again. And then I would like to know. I'm interested in your goals and your plans moving forward. So I don't know if you've given any thought to it yet, or if you're, if you're still riding the wave from this year. But next year, let's talk about Wisconsin, and then maybe if you have any other out-of-state hunts planned what are your goals in wisconsin uh, if you have any or any survivors you're chasing or what kind of caliber buck you're looking for and then do you have any out-of-state hunts planned or maybe chasing some different species what are you looking at for for next year mm -hmm. so so yeah i mean honestly 
probably the day after I kill those immediately think about next year. And I don't know, that's just kind of the way I, I am. Um, but I love the preparation. And so what my goal kind of is for Wisconsin is um, I would like to kill. I have a couple bucks in mind, essentially. I have two very, very nice bucks that got killed this year. Um, that'll no longer be able to chase this, excluding that 12 from that list. Um, and so I'm actually going to, I have one that I have in mind that I would like to go after, but I'm actually going to relocate some this spring. And I still have a, a couple of set cards to pull that I haven't checked all year. Um, so, you know, maybe those will show something different, but um, there's a few deer that I really like to chase and I would love to target them specifically. I would like to kind of rotate between two to three deer and hopefully have them on different properties. That way I can just continually hunt and, and not burn out anything and kind of resort to my scouting to make sure that I'm hunting those particular deer at their optimal time of year. Um, and I would really like to go after those deer and, um, and, and, you know, whatever size they turn out to be, I just would like to chase a mature animal and, and, and get that. And there, there happens to be one out here. I can think one or two out here. I can think of that, uh, would certainly be world-class and I'm very fortunate to be able to possibly chase those next year. So long as they live winter and the end of this muzzleloader season and all that. Um, but yeah, that's my goal in Wisconsin. Um, I'm thinking about doing Ohio again, just because, um, Jake is a really good friend of mine and, um, I, uh, it, it was very fun hanging with him and I was hanging there with Drew Emmington as well, who helped so much with the drag out and stuff. And he was a fantastic guy. Uh, it'd be really cool to be able to, to hang out with them again. Um, if we're going to do that again next year. And then I'm not sure. I would like to do something possibly before the Wisconsin season. Um, but yeah, I've, I've played around with a few things in my head. I haven't really decided much, but it's definitely going to just be an over-the-counter hunt and, and screaming out there. I may go out to Nebraska again. Who knows? Um, I do have a, a, a bone to pick with a certain buck in that area that I got awfully close to. But, you know, wherever the wherever the wind takes me, really. That's no, a good attitude and plenty of time. Uh for adventure in the future and, you know, other stuff, mealy hunts, elk hunts, that stuff. Antelope, oh, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I've talked about this some on the podcast, but antelope has turned into one of my favorite things to hunt and you would never guess it. I mean, it's like a goat, right? And the, the horns aren't yeah. spectacular or anything, but the hunting itself, and I really like the meat. So I would have never guessed. I would have thought coming out here from Michigan, I would have like been all about elk hunting and who cares about antelope. And it's probably, I like antelope hunting more than elk hunting. So would have never guessed that. So that's fun too. If you get a chance, you should do that's that. That's really so, cool. Some point in the future. So last thing we talked about earlier, but one more time, shout out, where can people find you online, your YouTube channel, if they want to follow you on Instagram and all that stuff. Yeah. So thank you. Um, the, the Wild Calling on YouTube, uh, it's the Wild Calling on Facebook and Wild Calling Outdoors on Instagram. Awesome. Well, hey, that's all I had for today. I want to thank you for your time. Great stories, a lot of insights, and especially for a guy that's uh, still relatively new, it sounds like you've got a really good head on your shoulders and a bright future, so looking forward to following along in the future. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on, man. It's a blast. All right, we'll catch you later. Thank you.